Okay, everyone, I've got a very special guest in a league of his own in the Canadian Hall of Fame of Mining, Ian Telfer, who is the founder of Gold Corp. He was there from day one to the day they merged it with Newmont to become the world's largest producing gold company. He was also the founder of what today is called Wheaton Precious Metals. It was the largest silver streaming company in the world, the second largest precious metal royalty and streaming company, over a $20 billion market cap. This guy knows how to pick talent. He's been there and done it. And Ian, thank you so much for doing this. I really want to jump into you know, our past, and I can endorse you. You've been a gentleman from day one. Before I became a big financier, you went out of your way to read my book, endorse it, give me some insights that nobody else had. And A, I want to thank you publicly for that. You, you've been nothing but a professional the whole time I've known you. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Martin. I mean, uh, yeah, you and I do go back a little ways. We've had a very positive relationship. And just going back to that book endorsement, just to tell a tale out of school, um, uh, you called me on a Friday and said, look, I've just written a book. I'd really like to put something on the cover from you. And I said, more than happy to do it. When do you need it? And you said, Monday morning. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm the only person who read your whole book in 48 hours. And I, I thought it was fabulous. I thought it was fabulous. And I was very happy to endorse it. But anyway, that's where we sort of, one of the places we sort of started. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I don't know where you want me to start. I mean, uh, well, yeah, what I've were the very... key aspects? Like, what made you want to start Gold Corp, which became a top three gold producer in its own right globally? And what were the key factors you've learned about, you know, uh, the assets, financing, management, the people? What were the key lessons you could share with investors? Well, the one thing about the commodity business that we all learn, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly, is the resource is the most important asset in your company. You know, if you're running other companies and other industries, the people are more important, but I hate to say it to the mining industry. In our industry, the asset is the most important. And so uh, when people are looking at making acquisitions or investing, look at the assets, number one. And number two, um, in taking risks on growing a company, and everyone wants to grow their company, but as we've seen, especially in the mid gold space, I mean, there's almost nothing happening. It's incredible uh, how everyone's just sitting there waiting for their stock to go up while the other stocks don't. And uh, that's just not usually how it works. And so I never liked taking technical risk. Uh, I wasn't a technical person, so I was very leery of of, of taking technical risks, if there was uncertainty about a project being able to be uh, successful and profitable, I would try to stay away from that. So if you look at my track record, most of the acquisitions, almost all the acquisitions I made uh, were uh, projects that were either already developed or almost already developed. So you sort of knew what you were getting. And, and the, the other mantra that worked for me over those years putting those together was that size matters it absolutely matters i think market caps are so important no one talks about them very much but i'll tell you if you've got a growing or large market cap you can do a lot of things and if you've got a small market cap you just can't do much and so the risk i was always willing to take and worked out very well i would take price risk on the commodity um, I believed in gold. I believed, I guess, more than other people. So if the consensus was $700 and we were looking at an acquisition, I'd say, hey, how does it look at $800? $800? And your technical people would say, oh, wow, at $800, this is a steal. And I'd say, okay, let's use $800 and go and buy it. And for about seven years, when we were really booming with Gold Corp, um, the price kept going up and bringing me on side and making me look smart and making the company successful. And so I see so many uh, CEOs taking the consensus goal price, plugging it into some potential acquisition and then say, oh, gee, you know, the returns are too skinny or the payback's too long. Listen, if you don't believe the price of gold's going to someday get to $2,500, you should get out of the business. You should just get out of the business. And so I would encourage guys, take price risk. Try not to take technical risk. Try to avoid exploration risk to the extent you can. Obviously, exploration is still the best way to create real value in our business, but it's the most uncertain and, uh, and the most difficult. And as we've seen over the past 20 years, the number of large 
discovered ore bodies is shrinking and shrinking. So it's getting harder and harder to count on exploration. So that's what I learned. Size matters. And if you believe in the commodity, then you should believe in the price and therefore use a higher price to make your decisions. So you went from, you know, founding Gold Corp, which was a dynamo, was an acquisition machine. You built a great team. You know, you had, you mentored great guys like Chuck Janess, who really rock and rolled the industry. Like the, you, you guys were aggressive and you did it. Then you went and, you know, I've heard many versions of how Silver Wheaton started, but that was a big pivot. And when you talk about de-risking, what an incredible value, because from a, from a, from a profit perspective, from an investor standpoint, the royalty and streaming companies have been far out superior performers from a share price perspective because of that risk. The generalist investor doesn't want that exposure to risk. So back then, you know, you were the, people can't realize that you were the chair of the World Gold Council. Like you were, you know, in the superhero world, you were Batman of the gold market. So, you know, what got you to want to start Silver Wheaton, which today is Wheaton Precious Metals? Right. Well, I, and listen, great story. I love to tell it. So, well, the first acquisition we made, you know, we, we started Wheaton River Minerals and then took over Gold Corp from there. And uh, when we started Wheaton River Minerals, the first asset we bought was a mine in Mexico, the Lewisman mine, and it was half gold and half silver. So we were churning along with that and it was doing OK. And then we, you know, then we bought Glamis and then we merged with Gold Corp. We did a number of things. But all the time when we had the mine that was half gold and half silver, as far as uh, revenues were concerned, we just, I could see, we just weren't getting paid for the silver. The market at that point was betting on gold. They were excited about gold. And we had all this revenue from silver and uh, we weren't getting credit for it. And um, I'd worked, I had joint ventures at that point with Rio Tinto and Rio Tinto had worked for years trying to set, and we tried with Rio Tinto at Alambrera to separate the copper from the gold because Rio Tinto wanted the copper and we wanted the gold. But we tried and tried and tried, and there was just no way to separate the metals out. Rio hired Rothschilds in Australia. They did a 100-page study about how you could split the commodities out of a mine, and their conclusion was that you couldn't do it. I read their whole report, and, uh, and one of the reasons you couldn't do it is once you, as a public company, own an asset that's half one metal and half the other, you can't. Uh, you can't announce to your shareholders, okay, we just gave the whole mine to Rio Tinto, but we're going to get a stream from the gold side. Like your shareholders wouldn't put up with it. They bought your shares for the asset. So when I read all that, I thought, well, what if you set up a new code that has nothing? And then you made a deal with the, the, the company that has the dual metal asset to take the offtake and put it in your new code. And so that's what we did. That was, it was on a Sunday night. I'm lying in bed at night awake, like I am every night, trying to figure out how to do things better. And it hit me, set up a new co and go to the market with a new co and say, look, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get a stream of silver from the Lewisman mine uh, from Gold Corp. And uh, we're gonna value it at, at, at a, a minimal value to put it into our company and pay them you know, we paid them, I don't know, $50 million or something like this, for, which for Lewisman was fabulous. They could use the money. And by giving us a stream uh, on the silver, it wasn't going to cost them anything or not, not hurt them at all. And so that's how it all happened. And I'll tell you a quick, quick story, and I hope you won't mind telling it. So we started to set up Silver Wheaton, and uh, I went around trying to raise money. And no one would, could understand it, and no one would believe it. And Eric Sprott, my good friend and the biggest silver bull in the world, wouldn't buy the story. Would not buy. No, I don't. That's not going to work. No one's going to believe it. All you got is a piece of paper saying you're going to get the silver, et cetera, et cetera. The rest, as they say, is history. We took it public at $50 million. It eventually got to $3 billion. And another little known part of that story. So uh, Gold Corp sold off about half of our position in bits and pieces to raise money and to take advantage of the value we created. And then the last 50% of Silver Wheaton, uh, we took to the market in a bot deal. It was the largest bot deal ever done in Canada. And it was one and a half billion dollars. And so in one day, Gold Corp got a check for the last part of Silver Wheaton for one and a half billion dollars. So that's how much value was created, but you can't believe what a hard sell it was. 
And again, Eric's a good friend. He'll hate this. Five or six years later, Eric's, what's your favorite stock on the planet Earth? Silver Wheaton. I love that story. <laughs> Etc. Etc. Et you gotta love those stories. And today, you guys have reunited again. So it's kind of great that the legends are coming together to back something. So at that point, today, Wheaton Precious Metal they changed their name. Uh, Silver Wheaton yep. is a, oh, I think it's like a twenty-one billion dollar market cap company. Correct. You know, you've hired and mentored personally many of the guys that are today running billion dollar royalty and streaming companies. So let's get into it now. You and Eric Sprott, Rick Rule, uh, myself, we've all put up big money, but more importantly, you're putting up your time, which is the most valuable commodity we all have, and your energy and your efforts behind David Garofalo and the team at Gold Royalty. Why are you doing this at this point of your career? Well, first, I'm just an advisor. So all the heavy lifting's being done by the staff, by David and his staff. And he's got a great team and they're doing a fabulous job. And I try to help out wherever I can. Um, but I'm a, I'm a David Garofalo fan. You know, I did hire him to be the CEO of Gold Corp. Um, his, unfortunately for both of us, his timing at Gold Corp wasn't perfect. And uh, so the, the right thing for us to do, we decided was to pass it on to Newmont. And that's worked out very well for our shareholders. So we're thrilled with that. And so when, when David invited me to become an advisor, I was happy to do it. Uh, I obviously, I've learned a lot about the streaming space um, or the royalty space. And uh, I think it's an incredible space. As you say, uh, Silver Wheaton or now Wheaton Precious was the first company to do it. And it was interesting, Franco, which had been strictly royalties prior to that, it only took Pierre Lasson about two minutes to realize that, hey, we can do streaming too. And, and, and so now we're the, the two biggest companies out there competing for assets, which I think is fantastic. And they've both done very well. And their market caps are huge, just huge yep. compared to the mining companies. So it's a great concept. I like the people. I think it's got lots of room for more competitors. And, uh, and I think David and his team are doing a great job. The biggest thing, my hesitation when I first started getting to know David was he was a big company guy. He was a big mind builder. He, you know, from his time at Agnico, which was in the Abbot Tibby, he was there for a decade. Then he went and ran Hot Bay, had that uh, almost merger with the Lundins. Then he went and you picked him to run uh, Gold Corp. He was a big company, big asset guy, and he was doing this essentially a startup. And wow, have I been impressed. And Ian, you know me well enough that I'm kind of a little bit of a rough around the edges. I'm an East fan boy who's done well. And uh, I, I, I don't have much uh, proper, you know, patience with people. But David has, a, anyone is so far in my career. Wow, has he come out swinging hard. And the plan that you said, you know, what you guys did at Gold Corp and Silver Wheaton was to be aggressive. But a lot of the industry became bankers and, and, and you know, former investment bankers that went and I call them spreadsheet jockeys that don't have the technical know-how and the actual experience of David Garofalo and his team. How important do you think that is in the gold royalty uh, future? Because these are guys who have built big minds, but they can also do the economics when you differentiate versus some of their peers. Yeah, no, exactly. I think it's very important. I think it's very important. You know, my background's financial and you know, my version of history is some of the mistakes we made at Gold Corp were technical. And I blame myself for not knowing enough about the technical side of it or not surrounding myself with enough strong technical people to avoid some of those mistakes. So uh, I think the technical background of the people is very, very important. And, uh, and, and so I think that's one of the reasons David's done well and will continue to do well. Again, his background's financial, but he's got some very good people to help him look at these assets. And the, so, uh, the key is yeah, to stay away from consultants. I can't stand consultants. And I see so many of these peer guys come to me for money because I'm a big pool of capital for our industry. And well, we've used this consultant and I right away, that's an alarm yeah. bell. I want guys with skin in the game that have yep. done it before who are expertise yep. in their specific toolbox using it again. And, and that's something yep. that I really think moving forward, David and his team are going to excel at. I believe risk is being mispriced in our market. And I also believe that as you're a negative swap line nation, these nations are going to start changing the game on the royalties, using the environmental factors to increase the government take, whether it's through taxes or ownership or, you know, all sorts. And then FX controls. You see what's happening in Turkey right now. If you're a developer or producer of something in Turkey and you're a foreign company, 
You can't just take your profits out. You have to exchange it at the government rate, not the world rate of the currency. So all these new hidden ways of keeping your money and your cash flow out. The, the political risk has never been priced in, ever. You know, I spent my career in Papua New Guinea and Chile and Brazil and Argentina. And, and uh, the political risk was never factored in there. I mean, people either want to invest in the country or they don't. But nobody, nobody's got the time or the knowledge to handicap saying, gee, well, I need a 12% of return in Ecuador, but I'll accept a 7% return in Canada. Like, that's too complicated. And our industry has too many challenges for people to be able to do that. I yeah, do exactly. see if the asset is big, the government will play around and change the game. And they did that three times to Rio Tinto now. Um, I'm, I guess at this point in my career, I don't want to lose what I've made, but I want to consistently grow it. I want to park my dollars where I'm comfortable taking my children uh, to the mine, to the operations to see where our investments are going. And I guess I've been to too many places in the world where I've needed to wear body armor and have security guards. Um, right. For me, why I'm so bullish is David has the same stance on over two thirds, or sorry, three quarters of the assets of the company, the cash flow are in number one and two jurisdictions on the planet, which is Quebec and Nevada. And, and I like going to Quebec. I'm Canadian, very proud of being Canadian. Canada's offered me all my opportunities and you have to seize your opportunities in life. And Nevada, you know, it doesn't get better than Nevada for mining. So that's where I like to go. I don't want to be in Turkey. I don't want to be in the Congo. I have nothing against these places, but from a resource extraction of, of, of going and taking the significant CapEx risks, I believe the analysts in our industry, exactly what you're saying, they're not applying the, the correct discounts as a mathematician, mathematician is my background. I do understand the probabilities and I see these factors being mispriced specifically when the FX factors are now being applied. Just the government FX reduces the value that many of these analysts and companies are applying to their own NPV. So I think that over the next five to 10 years, we're going to see that factor being readjusted simply because the cash flows aren't coming the way investors have projected. So those are the type of things. And more importantly, I also do believe that there's going to be a new carbon tax coming across resources that the governments are going to try, because one of the two things you can guarantee a politician to do lie and increase taxes. So expect that across the sector. What do you say to a young person? or new to the industry about resource investing, whether it's investing in the gold sector or speculating in the gold sector? I mean, a great question, a great question. You know, as I said, one of my concerns about the commodity business is it's very hard to build long-term value. And so if you're advising a young person where they should focus their career or, or focus their investing, I think you've got to start to look at least for a lot of your portfolio on places that can create value over time. And unfortunately for the commodity sector, especially gold, that's been very difficult to do. So I think exposure to gold is important. Um, and I think having gold in your portfolio is a very, very good thing. And over time, I'm very bullish on gold, but um, I'm, I'm more cautious about uh, putting all your eggs in that basket for the very reason that stuff just happens. Political stuff, uh, technical stuff, financial stuff. I mean, the, the stories. And then, as I say, we have the occasional scandal in our business. And the combination of those is, I think, what's keeping the prices down and, uh, and keeping people out of the space. So what percentage of a person's net worth would you recommend to have in the resource sector and, and not to pride, but what percent of your net worth is in the gold sector? <laughs> and I know you're probably an outlier like myself, but you know, what would you well, advise others to do? Not what you do. <laughs> well, I mean, right now in resources, I am right up to here in resources, but not just gold. Um, I'm involved in a couple of other commodities that are, and, and the plays are doing extremely well, and I'm very happy about it. I wouldn't advise anyone else to go as long as I have, but, uh, but, you know, you know, I, you could certainly have a third of your portfolio in commodities and do very well, I think. And I think part of it in the commodity and part of it in the companies in the commodity. Um, I think you'd be quite safe and successful doing that, but yeah, you and I are the wrong people to ask. We've been <laughs> in commodities our whole lives. 
it's worked extremely well. You know, we've all done better than the people in our high school graduating class thought we were going to do. And so, uh, so we're committed to the space. You know, my favorite story in the resource industry, and, and, and I don't know how you feel about me highlighting this, but it hit home with me. Uh, you know, my parents are immigrants. I'm from East Van. And I said, mom, dad, I'm going to get into mining. And, and, mm. and they were like, no, I want you to be a doctor, you know? Yeah. And it was a big setback for my parents. They were so upset. Um, the Ian Telfer story and the scholarship could you share that story to end this interview? Because it is my favorite story in mining. And, and what you did is, to me, the single-handedly coolest thing in mining. <laughs> well, <clears throat> yeah. So my story was I went to University of Toronto. I had terrible marks. I graduated. I had a series of terrible jobs. After five years of sort of going sideways, I decided to go back to school. So I applied to every MBA program in Canada, and I got turned down by all of them. And then the University of Ottawa phoned me like the day before classes started. Clearly, somebody got into Queens or Harvard or, <laughs> or UVC or somewhere else. And they phoned and said, you still interested? And I said, yes. They said, well, come on in for an interview. I went in. They said, look, we'll let you in on trial. Your marks are the worst marks of anyone we've ever let into a graduate program. Don't embarrass us. Fine. So I go there. But now I'm, I'm in business courses. I like them. I'm excited. I do very well. And then I go and, you know, become a chartered accountant and then get into mining. And then a number of years later, and I hadn't heard from the university, I get a call at night, you know, some student on a phone. Are you in Telford? Yeah, did you go to Ottawa? You, yeah. Uh, we're raising money for scholarships. Would you be interested? I said, yeah, sure. Okay. And I said, how much money are you looking there for? And they said, $5,000. I said, yeah, okay. And then this kid says, over how many years would you want to pay the five grand? I said, no, I'll pay it all at once, give you a credit card, whatever. So you could tell the kid hadn't had a positive response all day. He says, just a minute. So a woman comes on the phone and someone older, oh, Mr. Telfer, congratulations. Thank you very much. Give me your credit card number. We're very excited. And someone's going to phone you in a couple of days to find out what your criteria are for your scholarship. And, and all I was doing, I putting up five grand, the government was going to put up five grand. So it was $10,000. And the only part of the scholarship was the interest on $10,000. So back in those days, it was probably seven or $800 a year, six or seven, whatever. A few days later, woman phones, you know, tell for Ottawa Youth Scholarship, have you thought about your criteria? And I said, yeah. And she said, what's your criteria? And I said, I want this scholarship to go to the uh, student in the first year of the MBA program who gets the worst marks. <laughs> And so she says, well, I, I'm sorry, I, we're an academic institution. I mean, we could never do that. I said, hey, it's my scholarship. They said, fine. And to this day, in the syllabus from the University of Ottawa for the MBA program, there it is in their scholarship for the student that gets the lowest marks. <laughs> I love it. It's too good. And, and, then, and then just to, uh, the, the addendum on that is, and I'm back to the, I'm going back to the university next week, actually, for something, but I'm back regularly to hand out diplomas or make little speeches or try to encourage kids about that one thing or another and invariably someone will rush up to me and it's a couple of times it's been uh girls or women <clears throat> mr telfer mr telfer i'm so glad to meet you and i said oh great what's your name where are you from what are you studying how do you like the program she goes oh it's great it's great it's great and i won your scholarship and when someone says that, you have to laugh. I mean, someone's rushing up to you and saying, I'm the worst student in the class. And I'm proud of it. And so, Ian, you're a gentleman. You've been incredibly gracious with your time throughout my career. And I know many others in the industry, like Nolan Watson and, and Randy, who runs Wheaton. You've been a great, great guy to work with. I know Chuck Genesis has said the same thing about you. David Garofalo keeps you in high regard. Um, if our industry was full of more guys like you to uh, mentor the next generation, I think we'd have a very strong up and coming. But that is our weakest fact of the resource sector is the next generation. Uh, we've been competing with, the, like you said, the Apple, the Silicon Valley, the, the tech yeah. sector. So it's been difficult. And, uh, you know, it's good. But that also provides opportunity, everyone watching here. So, Ian, thank you so much for your time. Anything else you want to leave my subscribers with? Uh, no, I, 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 something flashed through my mind a second ago, but it, it's gone. But, uh, but listen, Mary, appreciate the discussion. Love to hear your story. And uh, congratulations on all your success. And uh, call me anytime, my friend. You're the best, Ian. Stay well and have all a right. great weekend.